Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, one of the programmers for Docklands, and I want to welcome you to Docklands and to this Q&A for Public Trust, directed by David Garrett Byers. First, I want to thank our supporters of the festival, our sponsors, our California Film Institute members, and of course, you, our audience. Now on to the film. Public Trust has had, had its world premiere at this year's Big Sky Documentary Film Festival, and is screened at Mountain Film, the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival, and numerous other festivals. We're thrilled today to have with us director David Garrett Byers and producer Jeremy Hunter Rubing. Brief word by way of introduction uh, about both of our guests today. David Garrett Byers made his directorial debut at the 2017 Tribeca Film Festival with No Man's Land a documentary about the 2016 military occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge that sparked international headlines. David also produced and shot uh, the film Massacre River. Jeremy Hunter Rubing has worked for the last decade at the nexus of politics and conservation in the West for foundations and strategic think tanks on a variety of public land and clean energy issues. He was executive producer with the Sto Story Group on the short film, Unacceptable Risk, Firefighters on the Front Lines of Climate Change, and it has been director and producer on several other short projects. Welcome to you both. Thanks so much for being here and congratulations on Public Trust, which is just a tremendous, tremendous film. Thanks, Ken, for having us. Great to be here. You bet. So let's jump in. Um, what, what was the genesis of the project? Uh, who, whose idea was it? How did it come together? And, and how did you both uh, come to the project? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with this and I'll, then I'm gonna pass the Jeremy, but like I think really this, this project, you know, it started from a topical standpoint, which is really kind of insane uh, to try to take a, a topic as big as public lands and then, drill down into it in terms of a narrative and fit that within the uh, documentary format uh, just because of the sheer scope in terms of the context, uh, historical and philosoph philosophical, but also, um, you know, the actual physical object of, of public lands. So really, I mean, man, this, this, this kind of had, uh, I think both of our backgrounds, um, the, the, the origins of this project exist in the, in the, in both Jeremy and I's backgrounds, as well as with Patagonia. But then it was when we all kind of came together is when the project really, um, you know, had life, um, started to take some structure and then also had uh, funding, uh, which is, you know, obviously super important, especially for a, a film of this scale. But I'll let uh, Jeremy take it from there and kind of talk about a little bit how we came together with yeah. and Patagonia. You know, I mean, I, I think this was something that um, I had been living and breathing for a long time, this whole idea of public lands, and that we've been missing a big film like this. And um, after seeing No Man's Land, which David directed about the Malheur takeover um, with an armed militia group taking over a federal uh, wildlife refuge and sort of how that played out, um, we met in Telluride, we talked about his film, he had this burning desire to actually dig in on the public land side because there was so much he had to leave out and I agreed with him. And um, we got to uh, talking and, and drinking too much. And uh, you know, eventually it kind of came about, you know, we kept talking, kept talking. We kind of wrote this like two page pitch and simultaneously Patagonia was looking for somebody to make a film about public lands. And we had another mutual connection that said, hey, you know, take a look at David, take a look at these guys. They're, they're interested in doing something like this. And um, after Patagonia kind of got our pitch, they said, yeah, let's do this. We we're basically like, oh crap, <laughs> now we have to make this huge film. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a lot more complicated than you would think. And, and, and when think, was that? What, I'm just trying to place this in the timeline. When was yeah, that, that meeting or when, was, that when did been, you get uh, the green light? Green light probably would have been late 2017. So November, December, 2017. Our first day of shooting was 
I think December 4th when Trump actually landed in Salt Lake City to rescind Bears Ears and um, yeah, rescind the national monuments in Utah. Right. But you know, we, we initially thought like first, if we could just explain what public lands are to Americans, this would be a huge success. You know, it's so complicated. There's so many managing agencies and so many different multiple uses and so many things going on, so much conflict. Um, but then beyond that, we're like, if we can do that, that's a huge success. Get people to understand they actually own this. But then beyond that, if they can understand how threatened these places are and, and never more so threatened than they are right now, actually, um, then, then we would have done our job. So that was kind of our goal from the onset. I apologize for the leaf blower going on in the background, but we will persist. Um, I, talk a bit about uh, Hal Herring and how you, uh, you know, came to Hal and decided to, to make his story and, and his work the main narrative spine for the film. I, I think it, you know, he's, he's an incredible character and, and obviously, you know, uh, a great journalist, but uh, how, how did Hal become part of the project? Sure, uh, our very own redneck Virgil, as I think he was described in one of the film reviews, which I absolutely adore as a self-identified redneck as well. Um, but he, um, so he, was, if you'll recall, he was in no man's land and kind of really provided a bit of uh, really, he, he along with a few others provided some kind of context to that occupation and then really kind of knocked it out of the park in terms of the ph philosophical underpinnings of like what was actually going on there. And so he was the, definitely the logical person to do this because he's, he's like basically a beat journalist who's living public lands. He's moved out to Montana to like raise his family in and around public lands. He gets a lot of his food from public lands. Like he gets his firewood from public lands. And then he writes about public lands and he's just been steeped in this thing. And he has a really nice, uh, narrative narrative arc to himself as well, um, but I was super resistant to to using him just for the only for the fact that I used him in no man 's land and finally, um, you know Jeremy um, and our director of photography Drew Xanthopoulos, uh, saw very clearly that it made all the sense in the world to do that, so they they were able to convince me and of course they were because they were right. But uh, that Hal Herring would be like the person to really tie this all together. And really, once we did that, um, it was kind of off to the races. And he was super cooperative. We're all great friends. And we went, visited him, slept in his home in Montana, and went on like dozens of camping trips together to like f figure this whole thing out. So it was really just like a matter of collaborating with him and figuring out like how to, to kind of arc this film out and use him as a glue to tie all these, not only, you know, three geographies that we focus on, but also um, connect that to the historical and philosophical context of public lands. Yeah, can you talk about those, those three major subject areas? Um, you know, you, how you landed on, you know, boundary waters, canoe area, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments. How, how, what was it about those three stories that compelled you to, to include them in the film? I'm gonna to toss that one to Jeremy because he was really instrumental in that one. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a fantastic question because you really could have, um, you could have drilled down anywhere and made this film all in California. You could have made this whole film in any state with any public lands, really. Um, and, you know, during this last three and a half years of the Trump administration, that administration has removed over 34 million acres from protection, public lands from protection. So, you know, Bears Ears, um, Grand Staircase, th these things are just the, the tip of the iceberg. But for us, um, you know, it was really relevant culturally because for one, Utah, that was a huge affront on the constitution. It's an attack on the antiquities act. And it's an attack on something that every president since its inception, pretty much regardless of party has used to protect land and create a legacy for all Americans. And this was an affront on, on the very fabric of like an important environmental law. So Utah was an important place to, to start, but also the storytellers there um, are extremely important, you know, you have this Native American background, but also 
collaboration and protecting a place that had come out of that. And it was a really beautiful healing moment that the Obama administration had started. Um, you know, and then we met, you know, we were working with this group, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, who are really interesting, and they, they're pretty prominent in the film. Um, you have this crossover of, of sportsmen who are really interested in protecting public lands. And we met Spencer Shaver at a barbecue kind of randomly, and he started telling me about what was going on with this mine and the boundary waters. And I was like, look, we got to go check this out. I mean, this is, they call it the blue collar wilderness. It's like one of the most approachable, easy places. In fact, is the most visited wilderness in the country, the Boundary Waters. Um, you just hop in a canoe and bring a fishing pole and it's just, it's an incredible place. And so it kind of helped us bridge, I think, the middle of the country and the east and like understanding that public lands aren't just something that's out west. Um, and then, you know, I think naturally the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska, I mean, there's, it's, it's the last great wilderness left on the planet, truly. And, um, the, the threat to that, I think, helps paint this really broad picture that, that these issues aren't just, you know, in one place, they're all over. And so that was kind of the idea is that if we could thread all these places together with the incredible people we met in each one, that's kind of what rose to the top. You know, could you, could you talk a bit about um, the woman Bernadette Dementiev, uh, who is the executive director of the um, Guchin Steering Committee in the film, and is sort of the main spokesperson in the in the Anwar segment. You know, how did you meet her and gain her trust? Um, you know, I, I found her to be just quite a remarkable woman. Uh, yeah, we're we're so honored just to be able to call her our friend now. Um, yeah, you know, that began through a lot of phone calls with Bernadette. Um, I was living in Colorado at the time, and we talked probably a few dozen times for an hour at a time, and we talked through what's going on. We became friends over the phone, literally, because um, it's difficult to get up to the, the refuge in that part of Alaska. And, um, you know, we finally met, and we went, and, and Dave and I showed up and started shooting some stuff and just became fast friends. And... Um, she is probably one of the most, she's just, there's no ego involved with Bernadette. She's doing this solely for her people and her grandkids. And you get that, I think. I think that comes across. This is just what she has to do. And she will accomplish that by any means necessary. And she's really welcome to, you know, outsiders that a lot of communities might not be, as long as they're respectful and like show up for her. And so that's kind of been, um, our understanding is that you can't just drop in in a place and extract a story. You have to continue a relationship. And um, Bernadette is like, you know, she's a force. She's incredible. In terms of updates, um, you know, just a week ago, you know, um, it was reported the Department of the Interior approved plans to open Anwar for leases to drill for oil. Does that mean we can expect leases to be granted and oil drilling to begin? Um, you know, what's, what's sort of the timeline with that? And, um, you know, what would that mean for the coastal plain and the, and the porcupine caribou herd? You wanna jump in, Dave? Oh no, that's all you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, Yes, that is a record of decision. It's a very important thing. It's a step forward towards uh, a lease, lease sales that would happen up there. Um, there are legal challenges, of course, um, and there will continue to be. My understanding is that there, you know, the, what came out of the Department of the Interior is that they want to try to have those lease sales as fast as they can. They said as early as um, winter of 2021, but then there was a comment from Secretary Bernhardt that maybe they'd, they'd be able to do it by the end of 2020. Um, it's a rush job. And frankly, by not doing your groundwork properly and not even, even if you disagree with the science that's in your face saying that you can't do this without impact, um, if you rush it through, you're gonna miss things and it's gonna be subject to legal challenge. So, you know, it's hard to say from, from the armchair down here in the lower 48 what's really going to happen. But if those lease sale happens, that's incredibly difficult to undo. 
that's incredibly difficult to go back and, and take those away. And it would just be devastating, even if the, the drilling doesn't happen, if it's not economic. Like, we have a glut of cheap oil right now in this world, so it's absurd to me that we would be leasing this fragile place. But, you know, if those lease sales were to go through and a major company were to hold them, boy, to get that back would be a hell of a lift. Yeah. Uh, as far as the other... The other sites in the film, Bears Ears and Grand Staircase and the Boundary Waters, um, you know, in terms of, you know, you, you alluded to it earlier with, uh, um, you know, Trump kind of reversing the Antiquities Act, whether that's a legal action or not. What, where are we with legal action to, to reverse what Trump has done by, by reducing, you know, the amount of public land in those those two monuments and reducing them by huge amounts. Yeah, I mean, this probably, Dave always wants me to be on top of these issues, so I'll <laughs> jump in, but um, I think there's a more, a bigger philosophical question there too, and maybe Dave, you can jump in, like, cause just reversing Trump stuff isn't enough. We, you know, we weren't doing enough to protect these places before that. But um, yeah, legally, you know, the, the Bears Ears Grand Staircase, um, the lawsuit against that decision has standing. The Trump administration had asked for that to be thrown out and it hasn't been. So I think the expectation is that kind of any minute now there could be some ruling from a, a federal judge on that. And, um, or at least that, that case will progress. And I think there's a lot of, um, people are positive of the outcome that it would re reinstate protections. But right now, the place is in limbo. I mean, it has no, there's no understanding of like where the, the border actually is. And they're operating as if it's the executive administration's borders. But locals on the ground say that the area is managed by Google right now because you just Google where you want to go do something or, you know, there's no management. Um, Boundary Waters has a, bill that's progressing through the house right now it's moved through subcommittee that would protect the watershed and um it would withdraw those mineral um claims or the 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 mining concept and you know with covid and with where things are right now with the house i think that's a little bit stalled out but um you know spencer would would be able to update me a little more on that soon but yeah there's a really promising bill that's got bipartisan support to protect it um the Senate, however, getting that through the Senate is is very questionable. So I think that's um, kind of the most recent updates on both those places. You know, you alluded to it a, a minute ago, but it, it was a specific question I wanted to ask, which is, you know, while a Biden election would obviously portel, portend well for public lands compared to four more years of Trump, just because you know of the different priorities of the different parties and who they represent, what other strategies, electorally, administratively, legally, can be employed to keep the public lands safe, regardless of who is the next president? And what can people, average ordinary people, do to stand up and support the public lands? Sure. I think um, one thing that you know. I'm always advocating for and, and I think this this film is part of is like just shining daylight on this issue and like having people understand what public lands are and knowing that like Jeremy said earlier knowing that they belong to them you know for me coming from you know I grew up in Georgia for the first 20 years of my life moved out to Colorado um, in my late 20s I had no idea what federal public lands were or the concept of this thing you know um, so I and I didn't certainly didn't know the scale of it you know beyond like national parks and stuff like that and i think my journey from kind of this complete ignorance of the subject to um to like a rudimentary understanding is what we're hoping for everyone on this and that it becomes important to them and so uh, you know this film is a tool to to do both of those things but i think we also need to you know reach out to those around us and especially those who aren't you know typically those who enjoy public lands you know that it's not just the mountain climbing you know mountain biking hiking like a crowd 
you know, and like get people out there who, to, to be on these lands because they do belong to them. So for me, it's, it's about kind of building this constituency for public lands. And it's something we could all get behind, you know, like who, I, I could, like, unless I was some like, and there are people like this, I had some like crazy ideological, like, uh, you know, opposition to public lands. Like I can't be mad that I can go out and like camp on Bureau of Land Management land and like explore the Red Rock Canyons of Southern Utah and, you know, go out to the Bob Marshall wilderness in Montana and spend two weeks backpacking. Like these are things that are, they're, it's low hanging fruit in terms of getting people on board with, but really the, the challenge is getting them to know what they are, uh, understand what they are and, and like really kind of internalize the fact that those belong to them. Yeah, I mean, one of the things Hal says in the movie is, you know, the future of the American public lands is as important to our nation as the Constitution itself. You know, that that seemed, it, it's a simple statement, that, but it, it really hit home for me that it is just something that fundamental to who we are as a people, um, and yet we're vulnerable to, to losing it. Um, you know, as when you set out to make this movie as you made the movie and then and now and now as you're talking about the finished movie and people are seeing it do you think people realize how important the public lands are to our nation and to who we are as as a people yeah i think there's you know there's two ways of looking at the public lands one is this you know amazing shared heritage that we all have together and it's it's a really beautiful thing in that way um, and another is to look at it as the last cash cow on the planet, you know? And so there's, there's this kind of those two opposing views. Um, and for, for us, like making this film, you know, we think it is a bedrock concept of what it means to be an American, you know, warts, warts and all, you know, it, it, it definitely has, it's, you know, all of this land was native land before, before the, the first Europeans set foot out here. Um, so there is, you know, a checkered history to it, but at the same time, this is what we have now. And, and I think that the fact that we own this all together is one of the last like unifying concepts in a, in a nation that's over overwhelmingly and increasingly uh, divided on things. And so that to me is, is kind of like why it's so American is, is that it, it, it not only balances the concept of, into individual freedom and common good, but it actually enhances both simultaneously. And so that for me is why it feels like one of the bedrock concepts of you know, what it means to be, you know, America at its best. This, um, one of the things you show in the film is, you know, this effort to sell off public lands and, you know, to transfer public lands to state control that will lead to privatization. Is there any, update on on that situation um you know it seems like um yeah just just any any news there yeah uh there <laughs> absolutely is um that that effort is it, this is amazing to me in the past this has not been a partisan issue right and the gop honestly is making it not one now at their own risk it is still a part of the gop party platform the transfer of public lands i am so surprised by that continuously it's like because i know there are individual decision makers who do not agree with this regardless of their party um you know as the former republican legislator says in the film from minnesota craig shavery says you know these are ex it's an extremely popular idea why would you undermine this but um william perry penley is serving as the kind of default de facto um director of the bureau of land management and this guy has built his entire career. He's a sagebrush rebel. He's built his entire career on the fact that these lands need to be transferred. Um, and his nomination to be confirmed by the Senate was just pulled um, like a week and a half ago. Very political reasons, because it would force some Republican senators who are very vulnerable in this election cycle, namely um, Cory Gardner in Colorado, Senator Gardner, and uh, Danes in Montana to then vote to confirm somebody who wants to transfer public lands in states where public lands are bread and butter. Like you don't mess with public lands in Montana. You don't mess with public lands in Colorado if you want to win an election. And so it was a very political move 
and in this legally suspect way, um, the way they had written the rules that, okay, so we don't have a nominee right now, but the default de facto person running the BLM is the deputy director who would be the same guy. And so that who is who is running this massive bureau. Um, so I think the update is that despite what politicians may say on camera and, and, and in confirmation hearings, the people who are actually running these agencies right now are people who would undermine the American public of their birthright, you know? Um, so that's, that's the update. It's very much a threat. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. And, and I, um, so I want to, um, ask you guys, you know, the film is one of the things it, it does many things so incredibly well and including it's very, very well edited. So hats off to your editor. Um, the, um, you know, one thing I wanted to highlight here though, is it has a very Im uh, impressive balance to it in terms of tone. You know, on the one hand, uh, um, you know, there are some st stark warnings here, alarm bells are being sounded. But on the other hand, you know, there's also a sense of optimism and, you know, that, that people are able to make a difference and especially when they're organized. Um, you know, so sitting here today, you know, how do you feel in terms of that balance between optimism and alarm when it comes to protecting our public lands? Oh man, Ken, I wish you could have seen some earlier cuts of the film. <laughs> um, yeah. That's, uh, that's something that we were constantly, you know, trying to balance is like, we wanted it to be, I think we, when we were pitching it, Jeremy, what would you say? The part level, part love letter, part expose, and then part educational platform. And those were kind of the three things we were trying to do is like, make sure that we were achieving all three of those in a balanced way without compromising one of them, you know, giving people a rudimentary understanding of public lands is obviously uh, essential, but then also like, not only sounding the alarm bells, like you said, but also striking the chords of reconciliation and, um, you know, inspiration and aspiration, you know, of what it, what, what, what are the better angels, better, better angels of, you know, the American nature for, for, to absolutely butcher a, a, a metaphor there. But, um, but, you know, those were the three things that were very important to us. And so balancing those was just constant. And you're, and you're absolutely right. Like uh, Lyman Smith, our editor, was so instrumental in doing that, you know, and me and Jeremy and Lyman just constantly putting our heads together and watching cuts over and over again and being like, oh, this version feels a little darker than the previous version, or this one just feels a little too woo woo, like with style it back, you know, it's definitely, and like we disagreed a lot on this as well, which I think was an important part of the creative process as well, is this creative t tension pulling us in different directions to make sure that we were honest with ourselves that we were actually seeing the film for what it is rather than just, you know, kind of, you know, not being able to see the forest for the trees. The only thing I would add to that is, you know, we are in this pretty dark moment on the surface when you talk about public lands, I mean, or, or a lot of issues, but, you know, President Trump is the only president in United States history that has removed more protection for public lands than he's protected. The only president in history. But we're in this moment right now, in this coronavirus moment, where more people than ever are, are figuring out their public lands and um, getting out into them. And we're learning these really important lessons that if we want to keep this thing, we got to be more inclusive. You know, too often people use public lands look like me. And um, that I think a lot of folks haven't been invited into our public land system in the past. And so we're losing some, or we're, we're learning some important lessons about like, hey, if we want to keep this, this has to be a broad tent. And by the way, like we talk about equality, let's make sure we're having equality in our public lands and they're safe places and approachable places for other folks. And so I think there's a lot of reasons to be super positive. Um, but as Dave has said, and I think he puts it really well, it's, you know, we didn't want to let the audience off the hook at the end. This, we get to keep this if we fight for it. You know, this is about our democracy and we got to be involved citizens if we want this. Yeah. I think that's a great note to, to end on. Um, I think uh, you guys have done us all such a great service by putting these issues front and center and doing so, so beautifully and artfully, I would add. 
Um, so I want to thank you both, congratulate you, Jeremy and David, on an incredible film. Thank you for uh, being with us today. And uh, to our audience, please do spread the word, not only about this film, but about our public lands as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Ken.